Hi, thanks for tuning in. In this segment of Container Digitalks, we wanted to learn more about the current status of the IMO 2020 sulfur cap regulation, which was officially enacted the 1st of January, 2020. So to get some insight on this, I reached out to Jan Tiedemann, Senior Shipping Analyst at Alphaliner. So let's do to talk about the current status of the IMO 2020 sulfur cap regulations. Hi Jan, how are you? Thank you for joining us today. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Alexa. Nice to see you. Huh. Well, uh, I'm all right in the empty office of Alphalana in downtown Hamburg, but uh, that's how it goes now. Huh? Yeah, I mean, quite interesting because we're, do we're just down the street from you, um, also in an empty office here. Yeah, so <laughs> I from across the way. Um, good. So uh, today we wanted to talk a bit about the IMO 2020 sulfur cap. Um, mm -hmm a little bit about sort of expectation versus reality. So uh, everybody knows that it went into effect the 1st of January this year. Yes. Um, and so I want to sort of bring it back to 2019 uh, at the close. And where, what did people speculate was going to happen? Like where were we at? The sulfur cap regulation was what, a 3.5% of the allowed yes sulfur content and fuel? And went down to 0 0.5 uh, globally. Okay, so what was the idea? Where, 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 what were the challenges expected for the shipping industry due to this dramatic change? Well, I think it was mostly uncertainty and the entire point is that nobody really knew because such a, such a thing has been uh, unprecedented in a way. And there was no clear expectation of how this uh, was gonna go. Uh, some people thought it would drive rates up. Uh, some people thought it would drive older ships out of the market. But, you know, it was, it, it added uncertainty to market, which, as you know, shipping is already pretty uncertain and pretty uh, cyclical and very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, for liner shipping, which is uh, an energy, an industry which com consumes a lot of uh, um, energy and a lot of bunker because these ships tend to be relatively fast compared to, compared to bunkers, uh, to, to bulk carriers or compared to tankers. So I think that people assumed, right, right, rightly so, that it would have a huge impact on the industry at the bottom line uh, because it would add a huge chunk of additional cost uh, to shipping because fuel and bunker is a major major part of overall cost in, in liner shipping. On the plus side this cost could be broken down then to at the end of the day to the owners of the respective cargo to the individual containers and there's ten thousands containers on one ship there's hundreds and millions hundred thousands and millions of containers around the globe so people thought well if we can pass this cost along on an overall per container basis, at the end of the day, it won't be uh, that bad. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, so then what are we seeing now? Did, did prices rise? Um, well, we are kind of in a weird situation because the whole thing just started on the 1st of January. So we're essentially just four months in. And it seems like uh, shipping lines didn't really have plans which were set in stone of how to, to deal with that. Uh, because obviously there are things you can do to mitigate the additional cost from more expensive bunker compliant low sulfur bunker, which is for example installing scrubbers, which requires you to come up with an upfront investment, but then you can benefit from still being able to, to use the cheaper higher sulfur fuels. Uh, and all these scenarios that the liner companies were thinking about, how is this going to play out? Does it make sense for us to make that investment? Or do we rather use the compliant fuels? Always assumed that there was a certain delta, a price premium that the compliant fuel would have over uh, the non-compliant heavy fuel oil. Um, and obviously all these scenarios, you know, in all these scenarios, you have to put some kind of number in what you expect this delta is going to be. Mm -hmm. And this has kind of been eradicated because we had kind of an oil price war going on. Oil was uh, dirt cheap very recently. Then we have a lack of demand from, from the coronavirus crisis, which 
also put uh, overall fuel consumption in the shipping industry put a dent in that, so prices went down once again. Mm -hmm. And also the delta went down between the compliant and non-compliant fuels, which means that we are not really in the situation that we expected uh, a year ago, that we would have, say, $150 per ton in addition, or $200 even, or whatever, to pay for that compliant fuel. We're just not in that situation right now, mm -hmm. which makes it a bit more difficult uh, to say, hey, what has the result been? What I can say is that shipping lines have finally realized that no matter what the price delta is, except it goes literally down to zero or very, very low, mm -hmm. um, it makes sense, at least economically, we're not talking about the environment or the big picture, but at least, at least economically, it does make sense to convert your ships and install a scrubber on the vessel and then benefit from the lower cost of uh, cheaper, non-compliant bunkers, which are then kind of made compliant by uh, having a scrubber. Okay, and so how many, uh, how much of the global fleet then is currently equipped with scrubbers? Um, I just checked this morning, so that I have some numbers for you. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 80 container vessels, which have been delivered with a scrubber already installed. Mm -hmm. We have 100, uh, sorry, 280 ships, which have been retrofitted in the last year. We have about another 120, 150 currently in progress. So at the moment, there are about 500 container ships which do have scrubbers out of a global fleet, which is at about 6,100, 6,200 ships. So 500, that's not a very high percentage. We're somewhere, somewhere between 5 and 10%. However, shipping lines have, of course, to recoup their investment and store these scrubbers on the biggest and most modern vessels. Mm -hmm. So if you see it in percentage of the entire, in terms of percentage of the entire global fleet capacity, mm -hmm. the scrubbers are installed at about 20% of the flow global container fleet if you weigh the number of ships uh, by their size. So it's okay. usually modern big ships that get the scrubbers first. All right, 20% 20 so 20 sounds like a much better percentage. Yes. Um, but are there any other options other than the, using a, a scrubber or using the, the compliant fuel? Well, the third option would be uh, to go for LNG. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about LNG, whether it will solve all our environmental problems uh, that we originate from shipping or whether it doesn't. It's, you could talk about this in endless detail and not come to a, a definitive conclusion, mm -hmm. but LNG, I think, which used to be a very niche market, and don't get me wrong, it's for container ships, it's still very, very niche, mm -hmm. but it's starting to get some traction. Uh, and I think maybe it's not a solution forever, but it's clearly a bridge solution between the situation where we are now and a more cleaner and environmentally friendly shipping industry one or two decades down the road. There's only two problems with LNG. Technically, it's not that difficult. To, can install LNG tanks and uh, LNG powered engines on ships. Mm -hmm. The problem is that there's a huge upfront investment because adding LNG propulsion, especially the tanks to ships is very, very, very expensive. Okay. That is the first problem. And the second challenge is that there is no global LNG supply infrastructure um, for shipping yet. It's in place in a number of key ports but it's not in place everywhere yet. So if you heat your house with uh, natural gas, usually there'll be a gas pipeline, no problem. Most houses, at least here in Europe, do have that. Mm -hmm. But if you need liquid natural, if you need to get liquid natural gas to a vessel somewhere out at Anchorage or some, at some port, uh, that's all new technology, transshipping that from maybe an LNG tanker to an LNG powered container ship. It's all doable, it's all feasible, but the supply chain is not in place globally. So if you want LNG to be an option for a container ship at the moment, you need to be sure where is that ship going to trade in the long run. If you're building a ship, which is a kind of vessel which can trade here and there, somewhere everywhere around the world, can trade to Africa as well as in Europe or in Asia, then how are you going to supply that ship with LNG? That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. However, if you know in the long run where that ship will be sailing, then LNG is much less difficult because you might only need one port on a 10 uh, week round trip, for example, where you can be certain that that ship can be supplied with LNG. So looking at this, what kind of vessels, a handful only, 
have been fitted with LNG in, uh, in the recent past, or in the past few years, is A, Baltic Sea container ships, because the Baltic is cold, it's freezing, the ships have ice glass, they are a very special type. And if you take a Baltic Sea container feeder, you know pretty certain that this ship is going to sail in the Baltic for the foreseeable future. Then you also have uh, American flag Jones Act ships, for example, to Puerto Rico or maybe Hawaii. You know these ships will be sailing on Jones Act trade, pretty certain for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So you could invest in LNG and LNG infrastructure. And certainly it's the very big ships, 15, 16, 20,000 to you upwards, where you know technically they could have sailed everywhere, but because of their size, these ships, these ships are made for the main east-west trade line, China, Europe, or maybe a bit later also for the Trans-Pacific. And you know that a handful of ports in Asia, in Europe, on the US West Coast, for example, would be enough in the long run to supply your ships with LNG. But the problem or the challenge of a high upfront financial investment, that of course remains the same either way. So you need to get the financing so that you can benefit from the lower cost of LNG in the long run. Okay. So then, do you know approximately how how much of the global fleet is currently using LNG? Um, currently, it really is only a handful of ships. There are a handful of Jones Act vessels. Then there are a handful of Baltic feeders, which have been built with LNG from the very outset. There's been one or two which have been converted. So it's really a one or two dozen. Uh, but it is now gaining traction for the first time in the very near future, the shipyards in uh, Korea and in China will deliver the first mainline ships uh, with LNG propulsion. In this case, uh, from CMACGM, French shipping line, which is going to deploy these ships on the Asia, North Europe, and second class of ships, a tiny bit smaller on the Asia to MED uh, freight lane. Where, of course, along with ordering these ships and signing these ships, the carrier has also secured that there are long term contracts for the supply of LNG in selected ports. Uh, and it will take a few years, or maybe, uh, to see that LNG spreads into a broader tranche or a broader sector of, of shipping and a broader sector of the container fleet. The smaller the ships go and the less tailor built they are to a certain trade, uh, the more it becomes difficult to, to opt for LNG. Mm -hmm. So if it's just a handful of the fleet that uses LNG and just 20% that's equipped with a scrubber, yeah. then the rest of the fleet is using the compliant, compliant. oil. Yes. Okay, and so even though that might not be the most economical option? Well, to tell the truth, at the moment, it is quite economical because um, the delta between the non-compliant and the compliant fuel, because you can talk about fuel price a lot, but fuel price uh, affects every shipping line more or less equally. Mm -hmm. The interesting part when you think about the scrubber retrofits or not retrofitting scrubbers or opting for LNG is the price differential between these three uh, fuels, non-compliant oil, compliant oil and uh, natural gas. And currently the, the, the delta has come down a lot. It used to be well over $100 and it has reduced to an average of $80 recently. It used to be 200. And I'm not sure on, on what delta between the fuels the carriers initially placed uh, their, their assumption for a scrubber conversion to make sense. So it's a bit difficult to, to tell you, however, not having a scrubber at the moment, at least, is not a catastrophe because fuel mm. is cheap. But of course, you're thinking a few years ahead, and there's no way of saying whether that will uh, remain the case. Okay. Yeah. So thinking a few years ahead, like getting out of this uh, Corona crisis, yes. um, and because of course we know right now there's not much demand, mm. and so. Um, again, making the, the fuel a bit more cheap, let's say. Um, when we're sort of moving out of this and um, oil prices arise again, maybe, um, again, deal with, depending on the political and economic situations, um, would it 
would do you see more scrubbers um like yes. more scrubbers getting fitted in, yes in I, I do think that a number of shipping lines are using the occasion right now mm -hmm. or in the, to to retrofit at least the big ships uh, with scrubbers because now is a good time because we have an overhang of capacity and usually if you retrofit a scrubber the cost is made up out of two components a there is the cost of getting the ship to the shipyard and installing the scrubber and buying the scrubber itself and for a big ship maybe you talk five six million dollars mm -hmm. however additionally there's also the cost of having that ship ship out of service you know you need to find a replacement vessel in a time where all the ships are fully booked and you need every ship to maintain your schedule mm -hmm. the moment we have ships which are unemployed anyway so there is a good uh, window of opportunity to send the ships to the yards mostly in china and have them retrofitted now mm -hmm. and i think that the container lines are taking action because they have realized no matter what you say about the scrubber from an environmental point of view and i said earlier there can there are discussions to be had but purely from a financial point of view even at a fairly low spread for a big container ship it's almost like you can't do wrong with a scrubber the scrubber will pay for itself in a reasonably reasonably short amount of time uh, maybe in five six years or even if it's 10 years for a modern ship uh, it's, I'm not saying it's a zero risk strategy, but it's actually, it pays off quite quickly and it's a very uh, low risk. Then there's also the question, how old are the ships? Uh, does it make sense to uh, install a scrubber on a vessel which is already 20 years old? Mm -hmm. Maybe not because the lifetime of the ship is only 25 years at the end of the day. Um, then there are also other questions of, there are certain types of ships uh, which uh, spend half of the life in port anyway, for example, on regional or local services in Asia, where the ship goes relatively short distances at moderate speeds and spends a lot of the time in the port which is congested or which is slow anyway. So that out of a week, the ship spends four days not moving and just three days on average moving between ports. The investment for a scrubber will be the same. The savings will be much lower compared to the ship which sails from Asia to, to Europe which leaves Singapore and then sails straight on day and night to finally arrive at Hamburg or Rotterdam three weeks later. So you have to keep this in mind. You have to do a very individual calculation for every kind of ship. And finally, there's also a question which is a bit unanswered at the moment. What is the lifetime of such a scrubber? Mm -hmm. Because it's the first time we're doing this. Some scrubbers have been installed many years ago already on, on ships which sailed in the special sulfur emission control areas like the North Sea or the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. um, but if I install a scrubber now on a modern ship at delivery of the ship, and the ship is supposed to be 20, 25 years old before it gets scrapped, well, is the scrubber going to last throughout the entire lifetime of that vessel? Or do I have to install the second one somewhere in the middle of that lifetime? Because there's a lot of uh, strain and stress put on the scrubber. It uh, is, uh, vapors and exhausts are toxic acidic and how do the materials keep up and don't forget as something that is quite often left out of the equation a scrubber itself needs energy to work so you can burn cheaper fuel compared to a non-scrubber fitted ship but your consumption will go up by x percent to get the energy from the fuel that's needed to run the scrubber itself and the scrubber needs quite a lot of energy itself Okay, so then it's a we complex equation. Yeah, it is. Uh, so then we have yet to see then how much the the cost of the scrubber um, will add, um, and then we have yet to see how long these scrubbers are going to last. Yes, but I think that people are quite uh, optimistic installing scrubbers on fairly modern, say 10, 15 year old ships, mm -hmm. and fairly modern ships and big ships. Because if you have the combination of a ship which is pretty big, that means it will pr probably trade on long haul services where it spends a lot of time at sea, going at a reasonably fast speed instead of just uh, going from port to port very slowly. And if that ship still has 10 or 15 years of life left, and you know it's going on these long haul services, don't worry about the details. I have the idea, at least I have the impression that's what, what uh, many shipping companies think. Mm -hmm. Scrubber does make financial sense at the end of the day. And I'm sure also that there are a number of deals going on, I'm not aware of it, but I can guess that, that there are investors who come up with proposals to go to shipping and say, look, 
we uh, provide you the cash for a scrubber. We, we provide you with a package. We, you don't have to worry about anything. We install it for you. We pay for it. We come up with some kind of mechanism where we share the rewards uh, in terms of uh, fuel cost or, or savings from fuel cost. And I'm sure there's a lot of that going on in some form or another. Yeah, probably. All right, awesome. So that's all the time that we have for today. And um, I really appreciate you sharing with us your insights. And it was, um, yeah, it was a pleasure to, to speak with you this afternoon. My pleasure, Alexa. Okay, take care. You too. Good night. Bye.